About 34 years ago, Honda created the Acura Luxury Division. It was the very first Japanese luxury brand to come to America. And back then, Acura was launched with two all new products, the flagship Legend Sedan and the Compaq Integra. Now, over the years, Acura has seen their fair shares of ups and downs, hitting a high point in 2004 with the third generation TL, which quickly became the best selling luxury stand in America. Now, some of you may argue that Acura is in a low point right now, especially when you look at their sales figures and a lot of their current products. Now, thankfully, Acura is acknowledging the problems. And when they introduced the all new 2019 RDX about two years ago, it was designed to show the world that Acura could very much be a tier one luxury player. So to see if Acura has truly learned from their mistakes, I've brought along this 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Velar. With an MSRP roughly twice that of the RDX, a lot of people will consider this to be the standard if you guys are looking for a European luxury brand. So while we obviously won't be doing a direct comparison between these two cars because one is literally twice the price, the big question I want answered, has Acura made enough changes to the RDX to show that they have what it takes to compete with the best from Europe? That's what we're here to find out. So there was once a time where an Acura TL was the best-selling vehicle in Acura's North American lineup. However, that hasn't been the case for quite some time. And today, the RDX is now the brand's best-selling model, with Acura selling roughly around 64,000 of these every year. It actually overtook the MDX to be the best-selling model back in 2018. Now, of course, the RDX used to always be based off of the CRV platform for the last two generations. When Acura moved it to an all-new platform in 2019, it really showed everybody that Acura was serious about challenging the best from Europe. And this RDX, as you can see, the design definitely still stands out today, even though this has been on the market for nearly two years. Parking it next to the Range Rover Velar, I'm noticing quite a few things. The Acura grille is very much bold and in your face. Acura has had a really big problem with trying to find their signature grille. I mean, they had that gigantic beak for many, many years. Now they've replaced it with this massive diamond pentagon, which I have to say is a huge improvement over the beak from years ago. This particular one here that I'm showing you has their A-Spec Sport Appearance Package. So of course you get the blacked out accents here. Their July LED headlights are standard, which include LED low and high beams, LED turn signals, LED daytime running lights. And then down here you have LED fog lights and some fake uh, grill openings here to give this thing a little bit more of an aggressive look. Overall, compared to the Range Rover, which has the signature grill that we've seen on Land Rovers for years, it kind of, to me, feels like Acura is trying a little too hard when you look at the front fascias of this car. Some people either love the design, some people either hate it. Personally, for me, in this Apex Blue Pearl, I think the car definitely looks very good, especially when you start comparing it to the baseline versions. Keep in mind, this one here is the high-performance SV Autobiography version. So exterior presence is definitely a huge deciding factor for a lot of luxury buyers. So when it comes to the new RDX, Acura has made some nice detailed changes here to make the RDX stand out in a very crowded luxury space. As you can see, this A-Spec model here has a couple of niceties. The massive A-Spec specific dual exhaust tip looks good. It's got a specific bumper treatment here with the lower extensions. It's got these LED accented uh, taillights, which are not actually a full LED. The turn signals themselves are just an incandescent, which is a shame because everything else is an LED. I'm really annoyed that Acura missed that little small detail. Now, looking at the rest of the silhouette of the RDX, you can see this is a big car. And actually, I didn't realize how big this car was until I saw it parked next to the Range Rover Velar. At 186 inches long, this car is actually only about two inches shorter than that Velar. So if you guys are thinking the two cars are not the same class, technically, they're, all, they're roughly about the same size. Now, a couple of things that make the RDX stand out as a car that isn't shared with the CRV is the fact that you got a standard panoramic sunroof on this car. You can't even get that on the Honda. It has an overall silhouette that really stands out. I like the proportions of this car. I mentioned earlier the grille is a little bit much. The rest of this car actually looks good from every angle. The wheels are also a really nice addition. Now, keep in mind, if you guys are looking for these beautiful looking 20 inch wheels, these are specific to the A-Spec model. The rest of the RDX lineup comes with a 19 inch wheel, which I don't particularly think it looks good with the 19s. You really need to get the 20s to fill out the wheel wells on this car. And overall, I think that our Acura did a really great job, especially in this apex blue color. Now for reference, this 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Velar is painted in this free shade of Indus silver, which to me looks a little bit more like peasant silver next to that apex blue pearl RDX. But as you can see, the Range Rover has just a certain swag to it. The massive 22 inch wheels certainly give it a stance. This car also has an adjustable air suspension so you can raise and lower the ground clearance as you're uh, choosing. 
The panoramic center, as you can see here, is also standard equipment. This is, for me, what I think a lot of luxury buyers demand. But unlike the Acura, you can see it has a completely different shape. The windows I'm also noticing are smaller for this car. Land Rover obviously did that for a design aspect of the Velar. It's going to hamper the visibility, which in the Acura is much better and easier to see out of. But as you can see, it doesn't really sacrifice much in terms of the exterior presence. Now at the rear of the Velar, you can see this particular one here has quad outlet exhaust, which really for me resemble buck teeth. I don't particularly like the exhaust, and if you look closely on them, they're actually just an exhaust finisher, just exhaust trim. The actual muffler isn't connected to uh, that part of the chrome part of the exhaust. It looks very, very odd. Keep in mind, this is the SV autobiography version, so the lesser versions of the Velar won't have that same ostentatious look to the exhaust tips. So obviously the exterior design is very important for luxury buyers, but Acura really spent the money and time in research and development when you look at the interior of the all-new 2020 RDX. Now first getting in and shutting the door, very solid thunk, which is again going to remind you of those expensive European luxury cars. And then turning the vehicle on and looking at all the electronics, you can see in the past Acura has been kind of guilty of putting some materials in, the, in their interiors which looked and resembled too much like Honda's. Today, if you guys look at the new versions of the MDX, the TLX, the ILX, the RLX, there's an infotainment system that is very, very old. You can literally look at the map graphics and it will date back to literally 10, 15 years ago. And Acura, as you can see, went a completely different direction with the all new 2020 RDX. The first thing that stands out right away is this all new infotainment system. This is a 10.2 inch infotainment system here. It's an LCD screen. It's part of their new True Touchpad interface, or TTI is what Acura calls it for short. As you can see, it includes features like Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, which looks nice. The screen is mounted nice and high, right in your line of sight, so you can look at it, look at it from a glance whenever you're driving very easily. And the screen also is very bright. It's crystal clear. It looks very modern, very upscale. It's all controlled via this touchpad here, which when you have it when you have it linked up to your Apple CarPlay, it's basically it works like a touchpad that you found like on a computer on, on a laptop. So you basically scroll around, and it basically will shift between the different icons in Apple CarPlay. However, when you're not using it in the CarPlay mode, when, and Acura says that it's like this because Apple does not allow you to use their true touchpad interface this way, it has what Acura calls one-to-one -one positioning. Now, the one-to-one -to -one positioning basically works where if you're trying to touch a certain quadrant of the screen, you basically touch your finger on that specific part. So if I wanted to touch USB audio there, I touch the top right-hand corner of the screen. As you can see, it highlights it and then push down to actually select it. Now, this system has a very steep learning curve. I don't particularly love the way it works, especially if you guys don't have very much time to actually get used to the system. I think it also needs to spend a little bit more time in the oven in terms of usability, because I think the touchpad here should be the same width as the actual screen. There should be an easier way for me to kind of look at the screen and look at the touchpad, because if I was trying to touch a specific quadrant on different levels of the screen, I had to actually look down to make sure I was touching in the right portion, uh, portion of the touchpad, which again, takes some getting used to. I don't particularly love it, but I'd love the fact that it's now an Acura exclusive system. It really shows that Acura I listened to the complaints of their old two-tier instrument layout, fixed the actual resolution quality, especially when you put it into reverse. It's got a really great backup camera, which looks fantastic. Unfortunately, if you guys are looking for a 360 camera, you have to go to the advanced model, which this A-spec version doesn't offer the 360 camera, but it does have uh, rear front and rear parking sensors and rear cross traffic alert. Now, in terms of the rest of the materials in here, Again, Acura really sweated the details. I love the seats on this A-Spec model. They actually adjust in 16 different ways. You get two-person memory, they're heated and cooled. They look fantastic. I love the suede, the two-tone look with the contrasting piping and stitching. This red leather even stands out, although I don't particularly love it with the Apex blue exterior color. I think the color contrast is a little bit uh, too much, but there's also lots of high quality materials in here. You can see full leather stitching along the center console here. There's full leather stitching here on the actual dashboard. There's a lot of soft touch materials in here. There's a lot of piano black plastic. There's a real aluminum trim. What I don't see, however, is fake wood trim in the A-Spec model. If you guys want some real wood, you can actually buy the advanced trim, which will include like this olive colored light wood, which also looks nice. The steering wheel uh, looks also good, although I do wish that Acura offered a powered tilt and telescoping wheel. That's something that most luxury brands tend to offer, so it's a little disappointing to see that they don't offer that. The gauges also, I think Acura could have gone with a full LCD display, although on this A-Spec model with the red trim, it does look very good. It kind of reminds me a lot of an Acura RSX Type S from about 15 years ago. I like 
the red color. This is exclusive to the A-Spec trim. In terms of the sound system also, this 16-speaker ELS Studio 3D sound system sounds great. There's even speakers in the ceiling of this car. Acura on the past have always had a really good sounding sound system, especially when you compare it to Honda. So overall, this interior has a lot of niceties in here. Some of the switch gear also looks like it's from Honda, but it operates with a nice precision. Even the dynamic mode selector here comes straight out of the NSX supercar, and it even shows this beautiful graphic on whatever mode you're in, whatever you're switching it to, along with a beautiful graphic in the actual screen. So as you can see, Acura has obviously sweated, sweated the details. There's a lot to like in this interior, but you can also get in it and be basically familiar with how to use it, aside from the true touchpad interface, which does take some getting used to. So to see if Acura truly did develop an interior that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best from Europe, I'm in the 2020 Range Rover Velar. And as you can see, the door also sounds pretty solid. I actually think the Acura's door sounded a little bit more solid when I shut it. But as you can see, this interior of this particular one here at nearly $100,000, twice the price of that RDX, there are certainly some cues in here that show you that this is an expensive car. I like the details that Land Rover sweats in a lot of their interiors. As you can see, the dashboard is full leather stitching here, leather on this portion, leather on the top. You've got this steering wheel here, which looks fantastic. I like the actual airbag cover, which has a different you know, color versus the actual steering wheel. It's also a powered tilt telescoping wheel. Again, something that Acura doesn't offer. But you know what, in terms of the actual feel, this car does feel special, but it doesn't feel that much more special versus the interior of that RDX. I mean, sure, the Acura had some pretty nice materials. This car has even nicer materials like the suede Alcantara on the headliner and the full leather everywhere. Even the seats on this one here are 20-way adjustable. They're also heated, cooled, and massaging. So again, the massaging thing is something that you can't even get on Acuras today, but again, you're also gonna be pay paying a pretty penny for that. Overall, the rest of this cabin though, the infotainment system has a two screen layout, which again, Acura just got rid of their two screen layout in the RDX. Now, looking at it in the Land Rover, you can see this interior for me is what Acura should have looked like when they introduced the two screen layout. The graphics of the screen look, at it, look a lot better, much more clear. You can see it's got Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Now, if you guys are looking to see a full review of this interior, be sure to click on the link below when I do post the full review of the Range Rover Velar. So in this video, I'm just gonna be talking about basically the differences that I'm seeing. The 17 speaker Meridian sound system in this car also sounds good, but I actually think that the one in the Acura sounds a little bit better. The panoramic sunroof, as you can see, is standard on this car, just like the Acura. It lets in a lot of light, but really this car isn't, isn't perfect either. And the infotainment system in this car is also a little bit laggy and slow. It doesn't work particularly well when you're going through the actual Land Rover menus. There are times where it freezes a little bit. There are times where I have to go into specific buckets to get to certain things. And as you can see here, it's not perfect, but neither is the Acuras with their true touchpad interface. One of the things that uh, really makes this car stand out, however, is just the kind of the clean overall design. I like the fact that everything here is a touchscreen. They've gotten rid of a lot of the buttons that people didn't like that especially a lot of the older Acuras had. But overall, when you look at this interior toe to toe for the RDX, it's, very, it's definitely a nice interior, but there are some cheap plastic that you'll find here and there, which isn't really befitting in a car with nearly a six figure price tag. Another indication that Acura is ready to challenge the best from Europe is when you look underneath the hood of the all new 2020 RDX. Now the base engine and the only engine currently available is Acura's two liter turbocharged VTEC four cylinder engine. This is actually the same motor, a detuned version that they use in the Honda Civic Type R, Honda's flagship performance vehicle at the moment. And in the Acura, it makes 272 horsepower and 280 pound-feet of torque. Now, when this car was launched last year, it had the most standard horsepower in the segment, although the Stelvio technically has a little bit more horsepower than this when you look at the base four-cylinder engines. In terms of a base engine, this puts out fantastic numbers, zero to 60 in under six seconds. It comes standard with a 10-speed automatic transmission, so not that horrible nine-speed that they use in the MDX. And fuel economy is pretty decent at 21 in the city 26 on the highway this one here comes with super handling all-wheel drive now one of the key differences between a lot of the european brands is a lot of engine choices and this is where acura continues to kind of fall short there because right now there is no upgrade engine for this two liter turbo four cylinder now if you look at the range Rover velar in comparison this car also comes standard with a two liter turbocharged four cylinder with about 247 horsepower the Acura actually makes more power than the Land Rover, which is very surprising to me. However, this one here being the SV Autobiography Edition, basically an SVR, has a five liter supercharged V8 that Land Rover crammed into this little tiny engine bay, and it makes 550 horsepower, zero to 60 in about four seconds. So I don't expect Acura to ever offer something that competes with this. 
However, I would like to see them offer a Type S model with about an extra 100 to 120 more horsepower versus the two liter turbo in this car. So the Acura's unique platform really starts coming through when you start driving the new RDX. Remember, this is an Acura exclusive powertrain with the engine from the Civic Type R. It's the 10 speed Acura designed transmission. So this isn't the horrible nine speed ZF transmission that you all are so used to that you've heard me complain about for years. And I have to say, the RDX, the new one, definitely feels a lot more premium than the previous generation. Acura has really brought back the sporty roots of the first generation model, but they've also, also taken away the rough around the edges part, the part where the car was a little unrefined. The turbo engine had plenty of turbo lag. It was a very peaky engine. The five-speed auto was a little bit slow to shift. This 10-speed really just bangs off shifts in a way that you know, you expect and demand a modern automatic transmission to perform. And even when you're just cruising out on the highway, the new RDX gives you a commanding view of the road, although you do have to get used to this odd uh, hood, which has the big bulges on both edges of the hood, which also kind of eat into the visibility. You've got these big side mirrors. Acura Watch comes standard, so unlike most of the European competitors, which make you pay extra for their driver assistance stuff, Acura doesn't. They basically just include it for you for free on all trims, so even the base trim. This A-Spec model also includes it in addition to a bunch of extras. But really, I'm super impressed every time I do this. Foot to the floor. Just a smooth, linear rush of power. This car will accelerate super quick, and for a base engine, you'll do zero to 60 in under six seconds, which makes it basically just as fast as all of the European competitors. I mean, this will keep up with an X3. This will keep up with a Range Rover Velar with the two liter. Actually, it might be a little quicker. It'll, it'll keep up with the Mercedes, you know, GLC 300, the Audi Q5. Really only the Alfa Romeo Giulia has a little bit more power than this. However, the, the Alfa, you know, obviously something that's gonna break, that's a brand that a lot of people definitely you know, don't have a lot of faith in in terms of build quality and reliability. Now, right now I have the car in its Sport Plus setting here. You can actually go into a Sport mode for the transmission, and that essentially makes the transmission even more responsive. It just has so much power that keeps pulling. The noise is something that I think Acura probably should work on a little bit more. I don't love the way this, this four-cylinder sounds. We'll use the, the paddles here and you can listen. They're definitely synthesizing a noise here, which, um, you know, some of you may like to think the noise is pleasant. I think it's a little bit too fake sounding for me. Uh, but again, most of the four cylinders in this segment don't sound good at all. But it really begs the question, Acura, where is my Type S version with a twin turbo six cylinder, you know, an extra 100 plus horsepower, zero to 60 in the four and a half second range. That's something that I think would really push Acura to the next level in terms of, you know, luxury, in terms of performance, in terms of the overall feel. But thankfully, even the A-Spec model with these big 20-inch wheels, you still have a very comfortable, compliant ride quality. When you start playing with the drive mode selector here, you can see going into comfort, it kind of quiets down that synthesized noise. The steering gets a little bit lighter. The ride gets uh, a little softer, although the A-Spec model doesn't have the adaptive dampers. You have to go for the advanced trim to get that. Um, but overall, it's such a pleasantly driving car, and it'll remind you of no, of no CRV you've driven. I mean, the old Acura RDX, you know, had a six cylinder, but the overall feel of the car was very soft. It reminded you a lot of a CRV. This still has very much that comfortable luxury feel, but they've added a new level of sportiness that has brought this car up to the next level. And all it takes is one drive in the new RDX to see that Acura means business. They are looking to, you know, find their place in the segment, improve their vehicles. And really, this is the start of it all. So Acura, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and apply the Type S trim to this. Uh, go ahead and apply this platform to every single vehicle you make because every other vehicle is in dire need for it, except for the NSX, but that's kind of a unicorn. That is a car that you know Acura barely sells any because it's a you know, six-figure supercar. So obviously one area where the Land Rover has the Acura beat has to do with the engine sound. I mean, this thing has twice the cylinders, more than twice the power essentially. So when I do this, <laughs> but obviously you can't compare this model here with its supercharged V8 with 550 horsepower, a car that's literally twice the price at $96,000. 
Obviously, this car is going to be the faster car in terms of acceleration. Acura just doesn't have an engine that can keep up with this car. But when you start driving the Velar just down the road, I'm surprisingly noticing how solid the Acura felt compared to this car. I mean, this car, Land Rovers in general, are just built like tanks. They feel heavy. They give you this commanding view of the road. I will say that I do think that the overall view out of this car has the visibility is better versus the Acura. And that's something that I think Acura should um, work on. I don't like the hood bulges that you get on that car, the two double bubbles. They take up into they take into your actual visibility. I just don't think it's necessary. It's there for styling, but it kind of affects the overall visibility of the car. Obviously the Acura is a little bit smaller than this car, so it handles a little bit better. I just would love to see Acura give us a you know a twin turbocharged V6, which is coming obviously for you know a type S model. They have promised a type S model will be coming for every one of their core models. The the, the, R, the RDX is definitely no except, an exception. Now, I will s compare the transmissions of the two cars because this has eight speeds, the Acura has two more gears, it has 10 speeds. I am noticing that the ZF eight speed in this car actually shifts a little quicker. Surprised me actually, because the 10 speed is pretty quick, but this just responds even faster to my throttle pits. Again, this is the performance model, so I can't really compare it too closely because this transmission has been tuned specifically to do that, although the Acura holds its own. For a car that only has a four cylinder, it accelerates you know, in under six seconds. This car here is about four seconds, so two seconds faster, but it's twice the price. And some may argue, what do you need this additional speed for, for twice the price? Is it worth twice the price? Especially when you factor in the reliability and the build quality. This is a car that you can't, I can't see myself keeping in the long haul. And that's kind of the case with a lot of the European brands. You always have to worry about what's gonna break. Should I keep it past the warranty? With an Acura or any other Japanese product, you really don't have to worry about that too much. Which, you know, brings me to my next point. The Japanese tend to be very conservative. And that's precisely why their reliability is better. But I, I would argue that there's a way for them to you know, let their hair down a little bit. Let the cars be a little bit more amusing. I mean, this noise that you're hearing in this car, you will probably never hear it in an Acura or Honda product because the Japanese, again, don't want to have all of that noise, the flatulent noises that comes from the exhaust. They say, they say that it's a wasteful noise. Why would you want that noise? But you know what, what I say to them? <laughs> be as wasteful as I want because here in America, we love that noise. So the Japanese really need to get on board with that and deliver what their customers want because we want <laughs> high performance SUVs. You know, if, if SUVs are gonna become the, the norm here in the States, as an enthusiast, I would definitely wanna see more high performance ones, especially ones coming from the Japanese brands because they have the higher promise of reliability and build quality behind them, which is something that is an important factor for a lot of people. So with the 2020 Acura RDX riding on its own Acura exclusive platform, it also has one of the most powerful base engines in the class and an all new interior with that all new infotainment system. Acura is indeed showing that they are looking to be taken more seriously. They definitely are looking to play with the top tier one European luxury brands. And as you can see, the RDX is a vehicle that's going to do that for them. It is again, their best selling model with about 65,000 of these sold in all of 2019. Even the design of the RDX typically has been kind of an Acura weak point. In this A-Spec trim, it looks especially standoutish in this Apex Blue Pearl. I like the styling elements that Acura puts on the A-Spec model, even when you compare it to something like that Range Rover Velar. And let me tell you, if you guys equip this Range Rover Velar with the similar two liter turbo engine as the Acura, you're gonna be paying significantly more for the Land Rover. As tested, that RDX is around $46,000 for that A-Spec trim. A fully loaded advanced version will sticker for just under $50,000. Now in contrast, that Range Rover Velar, this one here is about $96,000. However, However, if you're going to downgrade to the two liter turbo engine, so Land Rover calls it the P250 model, that's gonna start at around $56,000. You're essentially gonna be spending around $20,000 more for the Land Rover. And I would argue that the interior, the exterior presence of the Land Rover doesn't necessarily mean that the car is worth an additional $20,000. And as most of you guys know, if you guys buy the Acura, you're gonna be enjoying significantly improved build quality, reliability, 
and dependability. Jaguar and Land Rover just aren't simply known for something like that. So with all that said, Acura has indeed showed us that they can build a luxury car that can go toe to toe with the Europeans. However, there are still a couple of tweaks that I would like to see them make. For example, this A-Spec version isn't a true Type S model. I would like to see them offer an upgraded powertrain with an additional 100 plus horsepower at Type S model. I also would like to see Acura adjust their true touchpad interface, the TTI interface. It needs to be a little bit more user friendly and, friendly and have a little bit less of a steep learning curve. Even after a week with this car, I still had trouble using it at a glance. It just needs a little bit more time in the oven. But with all that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video talking about Acura, where they're headed, how they are looking to make their cars much more competitive in the luxury space. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews. Like us on Facebook. And as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll catch you all in the next video.